guess it's now time for member statements. The member from Nepean, Carlton. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, last year, I decided to adopt a program called Girls in Government and Leadership for grades five through eight students in Nepean, Carlton. And I was able to hold a one-day program at my own daughter's school, Victoria's, at Manordale Public School. We talked about advocacy and how girls and women can have the ability to make change. I was amazed to see the impact it had on so many young girls, and uh, including my daughter's best friend, Jaden Croucher. She's 11 years old, just had her birthday last week. She spent Friday evening with my family, and she decided that she wanted to advocate on an issue that recently came up across the province, and I know her class is watching right now. She wrote to the local media and to myself, and I'll read you part of her letter. My name is Jaden. I'm here to protest the 10 months of suspension for Dr. Mahir Singh Reki. I think Dr. Mahavir should at least get his license revoked forever due to his abuse of animals. Just because animals don't have a voice doesn't mean they can be abused. Animals don't have a voice, so who will speak for them? And Jaden concludes her letter, I'm hoping that my concern will make it to the court and they'll rethink their decision and everyone can write an M email to their MPP. Jaden's brave and she's also very sweet and she's willing to uh, be interviewed and talk about this issue for the next generation. And I stand in this house to say that I'm extremely proud of Jaden and all the girls at Manordale Public School who've taken a stand for what they believe in. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, today I will be reintroducing Jonathan's Law. Jonathan's Law will make it possible for an employee whose child has died to have an unpaid leave of absence for up to 52 weeks. Currently, parents are entitled to a leave while a child is critically ill or if a child dies as a result of a crime. But when a child dies as a result of illness or accident, the parents are supposed to be ready to go back to work after 10 days. Speaker, that does not work. The bill is named Jonathan's Law in tribute to Jonathan Leitao, who died of cancer in 2014. He was 16. Jonathan's father, Vince Leitao, and his mother, Espe Leitao, are with us today. And they spearheaded the work to pull together this bill. I want to thank Jonathan Miles and Megan Ferris Miles, also bereaved parents of their young son who worked on this bill, and Carolyn Baltaz, who is the chair of Bereaved Families of Ontario. I thank all of them for the work they did on background the work they did to pull together the law, and the courage they've shown when presenting this issue to the public. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you Member Stevens, the member from Brampton, Springdale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Two weeks ago, as I do each year, I had the pleasure of attending the 32nd Annual United Achievers Club Scholarship and Recognition Awards Dinner. On September 17, 15 recipients were recognized with scholarships in Brampton, with approximately 200 guests in attendance. The, key the keynote address was delivered by Ms. Tanya Walker, a Law Society of Upper Canada venture and lawyer. The United Achievers Club was established in Brampton in 1980 and gave its first scholarship in 1985. This year's scholarship recipients recognized at the dinner were Shanita Anderson, Kamina Carter, Kayana Crawford Matthews, Vashti Darko, Jordan Gray, Sydney Hussett, Rennell Manning, Jalessa Martin, Benjamin McDonald, Justin McKenzie, Akach Wu, Caitlin Pert, Denny Pellington, Sanjay Prashad, and Katria Phillips. Recognized for outstanding service to the community were all of the Free For All Foundation, United Achievers Seniors Group, and John Co uh, Cockburn, a past president of the Kiwanis Club of Brampton and an active member for more than 50 years. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. For the member Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I'm pleased to rise today to acknowledge Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Breast cancer is the most common cancer among Canadian women and is the second leading cause of death. It is estimated that in 2015, 25,000 women were diagnosed with breast cancer. Among those 25,000 cancer diagnoses, 5,000 women died as a result of this disease. Breast cancer occurs most frequently in women between ages of 50 and 69, although it can occur at any age. Breast cancer is not gender specific. In 2015, 220 men were diagnosed with the disease and 60 died as a result. It is important to be mindful of the signs and symptoms of breast cancer, which include a lump in the breast or armpit changes in the breast shape, size, or skin changes. Some risk factors may include family history, exposure to ionizing radiation, oral contraceptives, alcohol, or high socioeconomic status. 
Breast cancer screenings are available and recommended for women between the ages of 50 and 69. It's also recommended that women within this age range receive a mammogram every two years. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to acknowledge and thank John Baines and his daughter Kelly for my riding. Each year they organize bowling for boobs in St. Thomas. For years they've been fundraising and raising awareness around breast cancer. Mr. Speaker, the Canadian Cancer Society has also created a wonderful support program and funding initiative called the Women to Women Movement. It creates ambassadors that empowers women to educate other women about breast cancer screening and raising funds at the same time. Mr. Speaker, as October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, I encourage all Ontarians to get involved with their community to raise awareness regarding this terrible disease. Thank you, Mr. Well, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today is World Architecture Day, and I want to thank the Ontario Association of Architects for hosting a breakfast this morning at the Legislative Dining Room. World Architecture Day was founded uh, to remind the world of the importance of architects for building cities of the future. And it's important to acknowledge that moving forward, there's certain principles that we will need to rely on architects to ensure that our, our cities are more sustainable, are built in a way that's uh, environmentally friendly, and are built in ways that work with the environments that they are built in. There's also an ever-increasing importance of ensuring that architects uh, continue to build more affordable housing, as well as create density in effective ways. I myself am working with an architect on a project uh, that's near and dear to me, which is my home. And uh, in the members' gallery, I would like to introduce Oliver Dang, who's my architect. Thank you very much. And a special shout out to Canucks designers, uh, Sarah and Lindsay, who are the design team. Uh, it is extremely important for us to acknowledge the great work of many people in our society who make our societies better. But I think it's particularly important, given the direction we're headed in in society, to acknowledge the work of architects to do what they are tasked to do under the Architect Act, to promote public appreciation of architecture and the allied arts and sciences, and to ensure that we build cities that are based on buildings and houses that are sustainable and that lead the way. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And indeed, today is World Architecture Day, the first Monday of October uh, of each year. Uh, has been deemed to be this very important day uh, when we do uh, consider the contributions uh, made to our communities, to our cities, to our daily lives by architects. Mr. Speaker, what drew me to study architecture and to that profession was the ability to help improve our community and improve uh, my neighbors' lives. And architects throughout this province are uh, collaborators, artists, and ultimately problem solvers, solving the problems of how to make our communities, our cities more livable, how to make our grand places and our more humble places viable, pleasant to live in, pleasant to work in. Mr. Speaker, World Architecture Day is important because it focuses our, everyone's attention on what are some core human needs of shelter, of community, of space that is livable, that is inspiring, and that helps us achieve those things we aspire to. So, Mr. Speaker, today uh, we're very grateful to the Ontario Association of Architects, its president, Toon Dreesen, who's here to inform us about these issues. And today, Mr. Speaker, it's important that all MPPs recognize that architecture matters. Thank you. The member, statement, the member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased today to have the opportunity to recognize the great work being done by Junior Achievement in my riding of Lambton, Kent, Middlesex and right across Ontario. Junior Achievement is the largest youth business education organization in Canada, and for over 60 years they've been preparing young people to succeed. I was fortunate enough to participate in Junior Achievement when I was in high school, so I can personally appreciate the impact of their work and how they can inspire young entrepreneurs. Today, thousands of dedicated volunteers continue to deliver financial literacy, work readiness and entrepreneurship programs that give students the knowledge and confidence to meet the personal and professional challenges of their future. The Ontario PC Caucus recognizes that financial literacy is critical. We applaud Junior Achievement's work to give the development of these vital real-life skills, such as budgeting and investing, a greater presence in our public education system. With the recent revelation that half of Ontario's grade 6 students are failing to meet the provincial standards for math and the news that household and government debt have reached all-time highs in our province, 
Financial literacy is clearly more important than ever. Mr. Speaker, I want to encourage all students and parents to explore the opportunities offered by Junior Achievement, as well as to commend the businesses and thousands of volunteers who make these educational opportunities possible. Thank you. Thank you. Further members' statements? The member from Nickelville. Rainbow District School Board announced that significant decline in provincial funding has triggered accommodation reviews for many of their schools. What does that mean for my riding? Where in the valley they will move kids from grade seven and eight from one school to a school further away. They will provide, uh, and that's for the seven and eight. The other ones, the juniors to five, will be moved into another school. Uh, what does that mean for the people in Chelmsford? Well, the Chelmsford, Chelmsford High School would be closed. The kids would be bused either to Valcaren or to a school in Sudbury. Then the kids from Chelmsford, from Dowling, from Onaping, from Levac would all be bused to the empty um, uh, secondary school in Chelmsford. For little kids age four and five that go from Geneva Lake in my riding to Chelmsford, that means they will spend more time in the bus than in the classroom. In the west end of my ridings, the news is no better. They are planning to close the Lively High School. All of the kids from Lively will be bused, you guessed it, to schools in Sudbury. And the seven and eight would be moved into the already tight for space Walden Public School. I've seen this movie before, Speaker, and it always worked the same way. Kids in rural school in Nickel Bell get bused to big urban school in Sudbury. You know what that means? That means that the school is there to teach kids, but it's theirs to build healthy communities, and we're losing all of that. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Further member statements, the member from Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I'm honored to commemorate Rosh Hashanah, a very important High Holy Day for members of the Jewish community all over Ontario and in my riding back in Lawrence and all over the world. As members of the Jewish faith come together to celebrate Rosh Hashanah, marking a time of year in their lives to reflect on the year ahead. This past Sunday evening marked the first day of Rosh Hashanah, translated as the head of the year, also means the Jewish New Year and is one of the high holy day holidays. On this day, Jews are called to examine their lives, focus on penitence, uh, and plan for the new year. Uh, some of the observances during Rosh Hashanah include blowing the shofar, a hollowed out ram's horn. Blowing of the shofar is meant to wake up the soul and motivate repentance during Rosh Hashanah. Eating sweet foods like apple dipped in honey, pomegranates, challah symbolizing the hope for a sweet new year, and a special prayer is recited thereafter. May it be thy will, O Lord our God, to grant us a year that is good and is sweet. And I wish to wish all of uh, the Jews in my community uh, a sweet and uh, happy and healthy new year, and especially to my good friend Mel Korn, uh, who had a uh, a bicycle accident yesterday and was taken to Humber River Hospital, but is doing fine. So uh, I want to wish everybody Shana Tova, Umetaka, to all my friends in my community. Thank you. Thank you. I thank all members for their statements. It's now time for reports by committees. Reports by committees.